In this video, I'm going to be talking you through the answers to the Edexcel IGCSE paper on the 7th of January 2020. That was paper 1H. Question 1. We're being asked to work out the midpoint. Now, to work out the midpoint, you average the x-coordinates and you average the y-coordinates. So the x-coordinates are 5 and 13, and the y-coordinates are minus 4 and 1. Now, to average two numbers, you just add them together and divide by 2. So 50, 5 and 13 is 18. 18 divided by 2 is 9. Minus 4 add 1 is minus 3. Minus 3 divided by 2 is minus 3 over 2, or minus 1 and a half. For part B, write down the gradient of line L. Now, whenever you've got an equation of a straight line, think back to y equals mx plus c where m is the gradient and c is where the line crosses the y-axis. So just rearranging this, we get minus 3x plus 2, and you can see the coefficient of x is minus 3, so the gradient is minus 3. Part c. Now, to prove whether a point is on the line, on a line, substitute in the x-coordinate into the equation of the line and see what your y-value is. And if that y value corresponds to the number they're suggesting, so minus 302, then yes, it does on the line. It does lie on the line. So here, x is 100. So substituting in 100, we get 2 take away 300, which is minus 298. Well, minus 298 is not minus 302. So, uh, so this coordinate does not lie on the line. Question 2. Now, the lowest common multiple of any two numbers is when you multiply those two numbers by something, you end up the same number. So 28 times something and 105 times something are equaling the same number. Now, there's a number of ways to do this. You could just write out the first few of the 105 times table and the first few of the 28 times table and then just see when you first of all get to the same common number. But I'm going to do it a slightly different way. I'm just going to do my 105 times table here and then each time divide that by 28. And if I get a whole number, then I know that's the lowest common multiplier. So 105 divided by 28 is a decimal. So 105, 28 doesn't go into 105. Then I'm, I'm doubling 105 to get 210. 210 divided by 28, again, a decimal. Uh, three lots of 105 is 315. Divide that by 28, again, a decimal. 4 lots of 105 is 420. Now, when I divide that by 28, I get a whole number. I get 15. So 28 times 15 is 420. 105 times 4 is 420. So 420 is the lowest common multiplier. Question 3. Well, here we're told that the area of this compound shape is 129. So this total area of these two rectangles is 129. So just by putting this dotted line down here, I can see that this length here must be 3, because that's 6 and that's 9, so 3 is the difference. So I can now, in algebraic terms, form an equation, an equation for these two rectangles. So this rectangle here is 12 base 9 height, so that's 12 nines or 108. And this little rectangle over here has got a base of x and a height of 3, so that's 3x. So adding these two rectangles together, 108 added together with 3 times x, which is 3x, equals 129. So I've, I've constructed an equation which I can solve. So take away 108 from both sides, 3x equals 21, divide by 3x equals 7. Question 4. Part A, write down the modal class. Now, the modal class is the class in which the, uh, something happens most, so the greatest frequency. So of these 40 babies, 16 is the greatest frequency. So 16 babies weighed more, more than something, and that's the greatest number of babies. So just read across on the left-hand side, and your modal class is exactly copying down this left-hand side. So this, okay? So x is greater than 3, less than or equal to 4. So just copy that down exactly. Now, part B, work out an estimate for the mean. So there's a bit more work required here. So first of all, we've got to do this estimating. We know 12 babies weigh between 2 and 3 kilograms, but how much do they actually weigh? Well, we don't know. So what we have to do, we have to make an estimate. So we're going to assume 
those 12 babies uh, weigh exactly the midpoint of 2 and 3, which is 2.5. And similarly with this second row, we're going to assume these 16 babies weigh halfway between 3 and 4, which is 3.5. And this is the estimating. This is the assumption we're making to allow us to estimate the mean. So we're just basically, from now onwards, we're going to use these estimated weights. So 12 babies have an estimated weight of 2.5. So how much weight is that in total? 12 times 2.5 is 30. Similarly, 16 times 3.5 is 56, and so on. So we do this cross-multiplying to get all these little bunches of weight. Then we add up all of this weight, and we get a total of 144 kilograms. Now, this is spread across 40 babies, so make sure you divide this by 40, giving us 3.6. So don't divide by the number of rows, 5, which is the classic mistake. And similarly, don't round at the end. Remember, this estimating was to do with this initial assumption about the, the weight of each baby. So it would be a mistake to not round this to 4. Now, part C, one of the 40 babies is chosen at random. Find the probability it weighs more than five. Now, questions like this, you're going to, when it's asking for a probability, give your answer as a fraction. So how many babies are there in total? Well, 40. Now, how many babies weigh more than five kilograms? Well, here we go. These two babies here weigh more than five, less than or equal to six. And this one baby weighs more than six, less than or equal to seven. So three babies weigh more than uh, five kilograms, so it's three out of 40, three over 40. Question five. Now, when lots of information is being thrown at you, sentence after se sentence, it's really easy to get into a panic, particularly early on in a paper. So I think it's always a good idea to try and put the information into a two-way table if you can. And you, you're looking out to do a two-way table when you've got like boys and girls, and then sailing or climbing. So there's two variables twice, all right? Boys, girls, sailing, climbing. So I'm just going to set up a table, sailing, climbing, girls and boys. And the first thing I'm told is the ratio of girls to boys is three to five. So three-eighths of the children are girls. Three of five is eight. Five-eighths of the children are boys. So down here, I'm working out the number of girls and the number of boys. So 3 eighths of 120 is 45. So this bit in yellow, I've got 45 girls in total. And this bit in orange, 5 eighths of boys, that's 75 boys in total. So that's the first thing I've done. Now, the next fact I'm going to use is from this sentence. 16 25 of the boys go climbing. Now, the number of boys is 75. So 16 25 of 75 is 48. So 48 boys go climbing, boys climbing. So I can then go and, um, yeah, so far so good. And so the number of boys that go sailing, given the total boys is 75, the total boys climbing is 48, the boys going sailing must be 75 take away 48, which is 27. Now my third fact is twice as many girls go sailing as go climbing. Now I've got 45 girls, so I so two thirds are going to go sailing, one third is going to go climbing. That's given me twice as many girls sailing as climbing. Okay, so you can see that 30 is twice as many as 15. So how many children are going sailing? That's the total children going sailing. 30 girls are 27 boys, 57. A lot of work there, but there was six marks going for it. Question six. To convert from standard form to ordinary numbers, start out by writing the 7.8, as this is part of my workings. Now, because it's a negative power, this is going to be a really small number. So pop down loads of zeros to the left to give you something to hop over. Now, it's times 10 to the minus 4, so we want to hop the decimal point four places. So it's obviously starting off between the 7 and the 8. Hop that decimal place four places, 1, 2, 3, 4. I can see there's going to be three zeros after the decimal point. So my answer is going to be 0 0.00078. That's three zeros after the decimal point. Now, for part B, simply pop this into your calculator. Use your fractions button and use the times 10 to button at the bottom middle of your calculator, probably. 
and then using the fractions button it will give you the answer in normal format for numbers it will give you this big number here now we've been asked to give this answer in standard form so remember how standard form works your first number has to be between 1 and 10 so where would the decimal point go on this big black number here to be between 1 and 10 well it would be between the 2 and the 2 2.25 is between 1 and 10 so that's the first part of my answer 2.25 and then that's times 10 to the power of something and because this is a big number it's going to be a positive power now how did I work out this 7 well my decimal point with a normal number starts off at the end here the decimal point has to end up between the two twos so how many hops is that one two three four five six seven that's seven hops so your final answer is 2.25 times 10 to the 7. Question 7. Now note, look, there's nine marks going for this, so nearly a tenth of the paper, all in this one question. So if you can make your algebra rock solid, you're halfway there to getting a good grade in your GCSE. So 7 part A, expand and simplify. So expand is getting rid of the brackets. Simplifying is secondly, gathering like terms. So you need to do your four clause. So first of all, the M multiplies both terms in the second bracket. Then secondly, the minus eight multiplies both terms in the second bracket. So claw one, M times M is M squared. Claw two, M times five is five M. Claw three, minus eight times M is minus eight M. And claw four, minus eight times five is minus 40. So you've picked up one mark, you've expanded. Now, secondly, you're going to gather like terms. So you've only got this m squared, so that's part of your answer. You've only got this minus 40, so that's part of your answer. But gathering your normal m's, 5m take away 8m is minus 3m. Now, for part b, factorising means putting in the brackets. And note the word fully. That's going to mean there's at least two components outside the bracket. So not just a number not just a letter there's going to be two components so uh, what's the highest common factor of 5 and 20 that's 5 what's the highest common factor of y and y squared well that's y so 5y outside the bracket and open the bracket 5y times what gives you 5y well be careful it's very tempted to put naught it's actually got to be 1 5y times 1 is 5y 1 lot of 5 1 is 5y and 5y times what gives you 20y squared? Well, I need a 4 to get 5 4s of 20. Just envisage the claw here. 5 4s gives me the 20. And on the y's, I need another y because y times y is y squared. So 5y times 4y is 20y squared. Now, for part c, anything to the power of 0 is 1. End of story. Part D. Now, this fraction is what we need to address to start with. How do we undo dividing by 2? We multiply by 2. So 3 twos are 6. So 6 lots of the bracket equals 9 minus x. Now, it could have been that you could have done the clawing first and then times in by 2. That would have been fine. I've decided to times by 2 and then do the clause. So secondly, 6 times 2x is 12x, 6 times minus 5 is minus 30. So I've expanded the bracket. Now my third line, I want to get all my x's on one side and all my normal numbers on the other. Now you can go either way with that, but I think it's always easier to take your x's to the side that keeps the x's overall positive. So that's going to be the side that's got the biggest number of x's to start with, which is the left right, 12x being bigger than minus x. So I'm going to choose to add x to both sides. So that gives me 13x here and undoes the minus x. And to get all the normal numbers over to the right-hand side, I'm adding 30 to both sides. 9 add 30 is 39. So 13x equals 39. How do I undo times in by 13? I divide by 13. 39 divided by th th 13 is 3. Question 8. We've got to enlarge the shape by scale factor a half centre 1, 2. Now, despite the word enlarging, 
If the scale factor is less than one, it makes the shape smaller. It is half the size. So start off by marking the center of enlargement, which we're told is one, two. And then what I would suggest you do, it's almost like putting in a safety net. Put in these sunshine rays going from your center of enlargement through all the corners. Now, all your final answers, all your final vertices, the final corners, are going to be somewhere on those, on those lines. So just simply now, taking it from this center of enlargement, you need to halve all the distances. So take, for example, this top left-hand corner, which starts off being six along and uh, seven up. No, six along and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight up. Six along and eight up. At that point, you halve those, so that becomes three along and four up. And you can repeat that for all the corners, okay? Just work out the distance each of them is from the center of enlargement, not the origin, the center of enlargement, and halve those distances. Now, if you've actually put in this safety net of these lines, you can actually speed things up a bit. If you're absolutely sure you've got one of them right, you can just really follow the shape. You can just go around it. So that is uh, eight, eight along. So go four along, and that hits one of the lines. This here is six down, so you go three down. This is four along, so you go two along. And each time you're just double checking that it's probably right because you're making sure all those coordinates are on your safety lines. So this purple shape is my final answer. Half the size, half as far away. Question nine. So we're going to use trigonometry here. We're going to use Sokotoa. We've got a right angle triangle. We know one side, one angle, and we're being asked to work out another side. So visualize it from the point of view of the angle. So a picture yourself sitting on P. OK, uh, this side here is adjacent to you, is next to you. RQ would have been opposite to you. And PQ, this side here, is the hypotenuse. It's the long slanty one opposite the right angle. So we're being asked to work out the length PQ, which is my hypotenuse. And I know the adjacent side. So the two sides that I either know or need to know are A and H. So you need to learn your trig ratios, Sokotoa, or you might have learned something like silly old Hitler caused awful havoc to our armies, or whatever acronym you know. You must make sure you can just, um, you can just state this in the exam. It is not given. So anyway, A and H is cosine. So I'm going to use cosine on this equation. So once you've decided on the appropriate ratio, which is cosine on this equation, it's cos, you then pop down the angle. So that's cos 63. And make sure you get the ratio the right way around. It's adjacent over hypotenuse. So 20.4, 24.3 over x. So two steps of algebra here to make x the subject. First of all, to undo the dividing by x, we multiply by x. And then secondly, to make x the subject to undo timesing by cos 63, we divide by cos 63. We then pop this into our calculator using the, ratio, uh, the uh, fractions button. And we get 53.52 dot dot dot. So to three significant figures, this is 53.5. Question 10. Now, one of the equations of these lines has already been given to you y equals a third x minus 2. And then we've to start off with, just work out the equations of the other two lines. So take this one here. I think rather than do this in y equals mx plus c format, which is your natural feeling, I think, just think about the coordinates that lie on this line. So 0, 4, 2, 2, 4, 0. What we can see is that when you add the x and the y coordinates, you're consistently getting 4. So x plus y equals 4, I think, is the quickest way to get to the equation of this line. Now, any horizontal or vertical lines, be careful. They're not the same lettering as what, how the x and y axes are, are labelled. So think about this line here, this vertical line here. Think about any coordinates of points on that line. Minus 1, 0, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 2. What's consistently happening is the x coordinate is minus 1. So this line, this vertical line here is x equals minus 1 
which is parallel to the y-axis. Okay, y-axis x equaling something. So you've got your three fences if you like you now just need to get the area inside the fence now because all these lines are solid lines not dotted all our answers are going to include uh, an equal sign in our inequalities and then you just got to make sure you get the right side of the fence this is below the line so this is going to be x plus y being below four so less than or equal to four uh, all the points are to the right of this line here. They're bigger than x equals minus 1. So x is greater than or equal to minus 1. And you can see with this one here, this y equals the third x minus 2, all the y values are above that. They're above that line. So it's y with being greater than or equal to minus the third x minus 2. So with these compound interest questions, you really need to be comfortable with the multipliers and then appreciating the power is the number of years. So our, our investment amount, we kick off is six, six thousand pounds. Our interest rate is 1.5%. Now that's 1.5 out of 100. So that's 0 0.015. So the actual total amount when you've increased it by that is giving us a multiplier 1.015 so had the compound rate of interest been 3% it would have been 1.03 6% 1.06 and so on so just get comfortable moving between the compound rate of interest and the appropriate multiplier now it's invested at this rate for two years so the power for that multiplier is going to be two and then we've got an unknown compound interest rate for the third year now it's only for one year, so I'm going to call this y, is y to the power of 1, it's only one year. And when I multiply all of those together, I get a total amount of money of 6311.16. So I've now got an equation I can solve. So I've gone and multiplied 6000 by 1.015 squared to give me 6181.35. I've then divided by this to give me what y is. Now y is the multiplier and this is 1.021. So on this occasion, we've now got to go from the multiplier to the appropriate compound rate of interest. Because it's 1.021, our compound rate of interest is 2.1%. 12 part A, use the graph to find an estimate for the interquartile range. Now for the interquartile range, we want to take readings for both 25% and 75 percent we've got 80 men and women so 25 percent of 80 men and women 25 percent of 80 is 20. so go along 20 with a horizontal line with your ruler go vertically down and take a reading and we get 38. Uh, we then secondly uh, we want the 30 the 75 percent boundary that's the upper quartile three quarters of the way up uh, 75% uh, of 80 is 60, so 60 men and women. So go along 60 and take a reading, and I get 56 minutes. So the upper bound minutes is 56, the lower bound is 38. So the interquartile range is 56, take away 38 equals 18. So this represents the range of the two middle quarters. So you've rejected the bottom quarter, rejected the top quarter, and you're just looking at the range for those middle two courses. Now, for part B, we're told that 60% of the men took 50 minutes or less. No women took 50 minutes or less. So all the people taking 50 minutes or less, or less are men. So let's see how many people that is who took 50 minutes or less. So we're now reading the, the graph the other way around. Here's 50 minutes. Take a reading, I get 50 to, uh, 42 people. Now, those 42 people are all men, okay? And they represent 60% of the men. 42 men is 60% of the men. Now, we want 100% of the men. So let's just use in proportion. If 60% is 42, if we divide by 6, 10% is 7. We then multiply by 10, 100% of the men are 70 men.
question 13. Now, the area that we're talking about here, as we press down on this cube onto the table, the area in contact with the table is the base of the cube. So that area is W times W, which is W squared. So just filling in what we know here, we're told that the pressure is 0 0.14. Uh, we're, uh, we're told that the force is 56. And as just explained, the area in contact with the table is W squared. So we've got a, an equation here we can solve. So multiplying by W squared, dividing by 0 0.14, we get W squared equaling 56 over 0 0.14, which is 400. Square root that, we get W being 20. So the volume, which is W cubed, is 20 cubed, which is 8,000. Obviously, the volume of this is W times W times W. Question 14. Now, the area of a parallelogram is base times perpendicular height. So the base is easy, that's 14.7. We need the perpendicular height x here. So looking at this little acute triangle here, I've got x, I've got 9.3, I've got my right angle, and this little uh, acute angle here is going to be uh, 106 take away 90, which is 16. So using my Sokotoa, I, know my, I need to know my adjacent. I know the hypotenuse. So adjacent hypotenuse, I'm going to be using cosine. So cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. So once I've chosen my ratio, which is cosine, it's always the angle to follow. So cos 16 equals my adjacent side x divided by my hypotenuse 9.3. Now to make x the subject, all I need to do is undo this dividing by 9.3. So I times by 9.3. 9.3 times cos 16 is 8.939. So my area is base times perpendicular height base of 14.7 times perpendicular height of 8.939 gives me 131.41, which is 131 to three significant figures. Now for part B, I'm being asked to work out the length from E to G. So I've hooked out the triangle EGH down here to help me gather my thoughts. E to H is 14.7, H to G is 9.3, and that angle at A at H is 106 degrees. Now, using the cosine rule, okay, because I don't have a pair here, I don't know a side and its opposite angle. I've got a side trapped angle side, so I'm going to be using the cosine rule. And just follow the lettering of the cosine rule. The angle, the uppercase, they've called A. So I'm going to call this angle A meaning this side opposite eg is lowercase a and it doesn't matter which is my b and my c it doesn't so i've just made uh, this length b and this length c so substituting straight into the cosine rule using the a's b's and c's as i've described i get a squared being 9.3 squared plus 14.7 uh, 147 14.7 uh, squared uh, take away 2 times 9.3 times 14.7 times cos 106. Sorry, I paused there. That's a takeaway sign. It's not very clear. Excuse me. So popping all that into our calculator, we get a squared being 377.94. Square root that, we get a being 19.44. So to three significant figures, that is 19.4. I might just change that to make that a bit clearer. Make that a, a clearer takeaway sign. There we go. Question 15, part A. We've got to show that the volume is something. Now, volume of a cuboid is base times depth times height, so these three lengths times together. So 2x plus 5 times x plus 1 times 3 minus x. Doesn't really matter which order. So we've just got to multiply out three brackets. Now I've started off by multiplying out brackets 2 and 3, leaving the 2x plus 5 alone. So x plus 1 times 3 minus x is 3x minus x squared plus 3 minus x, doing the four clause. Gathering up my like terms and just rearranging, I get minus x squared plus 2x plus 3. And then I need to do my six clause. 2x times these three terms, then the 5 times these three terms, giving me this. And then I've gathered up like terms to show what I needed to show. Now, for part B, 
Uh, the differential equals zero at maximums or minimums. So you've got to be on the lookout when it's asking you for maximums and minimums that you might need to differentiate. So remember, to differentiate, you multiply by the current power, reduce the power by one. So 15 becomes zero. 16x becomes 16. And then minus x squared, multiplied by the current power, reduced to power by one. That becomes minus 2x. And minus 2x cubed, when differentiated, becomes minus 6x squared. So my dv dx, my differential, is this. And at this maximum or minimum, I set this equal to zero. Now, I've then chosen to multiply through by minus 1 to make my x squared positive. And I put my x squareds, then my x's, then my normal numbers. Because they're all even, I've chosen to halve them all. Now, this doesn't factorise, so I'm going to choose to use the quadratic formula with a being 3, b being 1, the coefficient of x, and c being minus 8. And then I've just substituted it into the given formula. And that gives me two solutions. It gives me x1 being uh, 1.4748. Or well, my second solution is give me x being a negative value. Now that can't be that can't um, that can't be because if I was to use this and say for example here minus 1.8 plus 1 would be giving me a, a negative length overall. So that solution is not valid. So my correct answer for x is from this solution, which to three significant figures is 1.47. Question 16. Now on these bounds questions, it's a really good idea to set out all the lower and upper bounds right at the beginning because you're picking up method marks even if you go wrong later. Now to work out the lower and upper bounds, I think number lines help. So here's my number line for A. So we're told it's 58.4 corrected three significant figures. So put 58.4 in the middle of your number line, then go up or down one significant figure. So the next significant figure up would be 58.5. And the next one down would be 58.3. Similarly with C, 20 to 2 significant figures. 21 would be the one next one up. 19 would be the next one down. And for D, uh, 2 significant figures. 3.6 would become 3.7. 3.6 would become 3.5. Now, they're the, um, the two extremities. Now, your bounds are the set of values, the upper and lower values, which will round to my 58.4. So anything all the way down to 58.35 will round up to 58.4. Anything just below 58.45 will round down to 58.4. And similarly, it's always this middle half. So you're going from 19.5 up to 20.5. 3.55 up to 3.65. Now maintain this symmetry. Don't worry about the fact that 58.45 would round upwards. We're just we're just considering it to be just slightly less than this. So don't make this 58.44 or something. So those are my lower and upper bounds. Now I want to make P as big as possible. Now when you're dividing, if you're trying to make it as big as possible, you want the numerator top bit to be as big as possible and the denominator to be as small as possible. So D we want the lower bound, that's 3.55. Now how do we make the numerator as big as possible when we're taking away? You want the first number to be as big as possible, the second number to be as small as possible. That would get you the biggest result when you take away. So we want the upper bound for A, which is 58.45, the lower bound for C, which is 19.5. Pop that all into our calculator, we get 27.4366. So to two decimal places, that's 27.44. 17 part A. So I'm considering the left-hand side. Now, root 12, let's simplify root 12. So that's the same as root 4 times root 3, which is 2 root 3. So I've replaced my root 12 with 2 root 3. So the reason I've decided to do that straight away, I can see I'm aiming for something with root 3s in it, so it makes sense to get my root 3 involved as soon as possible. Now, I'm going to be squaring that, okay? So 2 lots of 2 root 3 is 4 root 3, and I'm now going to be squaring this bracket. So it's 6 plus 4 root 3 times 6 plus 4 root 3. Squaring the bracket is just the bracket times the bracket. I now do my four claws. 6 times 6 is 36. 6 times 4 root 3 is 24 root 3. 
4 root 3 times 6 is 24 root 3. 4 root 3 times 4 root 3. Well, 4 times 4 is 16. Root 3 times root 3 is root 9, which is 3. So it's 16 times 3, which is 48. Now, gathering up my whole numbers, I get 84. Gathering up my root 3s, I get 48 lots of root 3. I can then factorise that by taking the 12 outside, giving me 12 lots of 7 plus 4 root 3, which is what I needed to get. Now, for part B, I'm going to do this in two steps. The power is minus two thirds. So let's sort out the minus power first of all. Whenever there's a minus power, just flip the fraction over. So this becomes t, t to the power of 15 over 27 a, a to the power of 12. But now it's to the power of a positive two thirds. I've got rid of that minus power in the index by flipping it over. Now, each component now has to be the, to the power of two thirds. Now, when you've got a power inside the bracket and a power outside the bracket, you multiply them. 15 times two thirds is 30 over three, which is 10. So that's t to the power of 10. And then again, with regarding the power in the denominator, a to the 12 to the power of two thirds is 12 times two thirds. 12 to the 24, 24 over 3 is 8. So that's a to the power of 8. So for the t and the a, we just multiplied the powers. Now 27, you know, the actual number, not a power, the number to the power of 2 thirds. You could just pop that into your calculator. That's fine. That will give you 9. Or just understand what's going on. We're squaring and cube rooting. Easier to do the cube root first. Cube root of 27 is 3. 3 squared is 9. So our final answer, t to the power of 10, all over 9a to the power of 8. Question 18. Now, it would be very easy to get into a really complex probability tree calculation here, uh, coming off of black currants, lemons and oranges, and you could do it like that, but it's making it very messy. At the end of the day, if we're going to end up with still having five lemons in the bowl after three picks, we just need each of them not to pick a lemon. OK, each of them not to pick a lemon. So all I'm going to do is just consider the ones that are not lemons. So there are seven oranges and four black currants. That's 11 not, that are not lemons. OK, this L dash signifies not a lemon. So with my first pick, not getting a lemon is 11 out of 16. OK, that's the four and the seven all over 16. Now, and not, uh, so that would be not getting rid of an 11 not having a lemon. Now with my second pick, how many are not a, le a lemons? There's now 10 of them left, okay, because either a black currant or an orange is gone. So with my second pick, it's going to be 10 out of 15. And then with my third pick, it's going to be 9 out of 14. So each time my numerator is going down by 1, and each time my denominator is going down by 1, pop that into your calculator, you get 33 over 112. Question 19. Now, the, the biggest difficulty with this question is appreciating what angle they're working through. Now, if they're asking for the size of the angle between AH and the plane, the base, EFGH, so you've just got to imagine slicing through this cuboid with a knife if you were going diagonally down from A straight downwards from H, you're going to create the tri you're going to, the, 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 the two dimensional cut will be down A to F to H. So the angle we're looking for is here. OK, so just um, just try and visualize this. OK, you're just going to be cutting through the cake. You're going to be starting at A. You're going to be cut. The knife's going to be pointing diagonally across. You're cutting straight down. You're going to end up cutting that shape. So always with these three dimensional trig questions, hook out the appropriate 2D triangles. So A to F to H, the right angle at F. We want this angle A H E. That's this triangle here. So what do I know so far? I know the length from A to F is 6. OK, now I can work out the length from F to H if I just consider the base. Consider the rectangular base and consider the triangle, so cutting it in half, going from F to E to H. OK, the right angle here at E. I know F to E is 5. I know E to H is 9. FH is going to be my diagonal. So my second two-dimensional triangle I'm going to hook out is F to E to H, which I've done down here. So this is looking down at half the base. So once you can see it like this, it's pretty easy to see what you're going to need to do. We want to work out the length from F to H. F to H. 
Now here we've got a right angled triangle. We know two sides. We want the third side. We want the longest side. We can just do a positive Pythagoras. So FH squared equals 5 squared plus 9 squared, which is 106. So FH is square root of 106. Now leave it like that. That's exact. So FH is 106. I can transfer that information across to my blue triangle. Now I know two sides, I can use soccer tower to work out my angle X. Now this 6 is opposite, this FH, this root 106 is adjacent. Opposite and adjacent, this is going to be a tan question. So tan the angle, so tan X equals opposite of 6 divided by adjacent of root 106. How do you want to do a tan? You inverse tan. So X equals inverse tan of 6 over root 106. So pop this into your calculator using the fractions button. You get 30.232 dot dot dot. So to three significant figures, that's 30.2. Question 20, uh, part one. So work out the coordinates of any points that it cuts with the coordinate axes. So first of all, let's consider where it goes and cuts the y-axis. This is when x equals zero. So when x equals 0, 0 minus 1 is minus 1. Square that, you get 1. 1 times 4 is 4. So it's going to be 4 minus a, or a, uh, or minus a plus 4. So y equals minus a plus 4. Now we're told that a is greater than 4. So minus a is going to be greater than 4. So this is going to be a negative value. So it's going to be cutting below the x-axis at this purple point here, which is minus a plus 4. Now, where does it cut the x-axis? This is when y equals 0. So set, set the curve equaling to 0 and rearrange. Let's add a to both sides. Let's divide by 4, square root, and add 1. We get x being 1 plus or minus root a over 2. So these are these two coordinates here. One of them is going to be a negative 1, again, because a is greater than 4 and the other will be a positive one. So our three places that our curve cuts the axes, cuts the x-axis at these two black points and the y-axis at this purple point. Now for part two, the turning point, well it's already in completed the square format and the beauty of completing the square is very easy to see the minimum point. The minimum point is where the y-value is at its lowest and it's going to be at its lowest when the bracket equals zero, okay? Because anything squared, the smallest you can get is zero. So what value of x makes this bracket zero is when x is one. So our x coordinate for the minimum point is one. What y value do we get at this point? We get minus a. The bracket becomes zero, four lots of zero, zero, minus a. So our, minus point, uh, our minimum point is at the coordinate one minus a. Question 21. So uh, we've been told that the h function is fg of x. Now this is when the g function is thrown into the f function. So you've got to read this uh, composite function from right to left. It's g into f. So x plus 3 going into the f function. So x plus 3 wherever there's presently an x. So rather than x squared, it's going to be x plus 3 squared. Rather than minus 2 lots of x, it's going to be minus 2 lots of x plus 3. So that's what I've got here. Then just process the algebra. x plus 3 all squared is x squared plus 6x plus 9. Minus 2 times the bracket is minus 2x minus 6. Uh, simplify this up and then go and complete the square on it. This is the key bit. If you're going to try and work out the inverse function, we must have x only cropping up once. So we're completing the square on this. So remember how you complete the square. You halve the, the coefficient of x, which so half of 4 is 2. So we're going to have x plus 2 all squared. Consider that fourth claw. Plus 2 times plus 2 is plus 4. We want to back out that fourth claw with minus 4. And then we've still got the plus 3 here. So x squared plus 4x plus 3, when we completed the square on it, is x plus 2 all squared minus 1. Now that's what our, our h of x is. We want to work out the inverse of this. Now this is where we have to change the subject. So we let y equal our function. Then just rearrange it to make x the subject. So we add 1. 
we we square root remember we square root we're going to get a plus or minus so plus or minus the square root of y plus one and then we take away the two so uh, so x is equaling minus two plus or minus root y plus one now remember y is just something we artificially introduced to help us change the subject so our final answer for the inverse function we replace the y's with x's so our inverse function is going to be minus two plus or minus the square root of x plus one now, finally, um, because we're told we're, uh, we're told that x is greater than or equal to minus two, okay, we're not going to have the negative option here because you can't square root a negative, so it's going to be minus two plus root x plus one. So we've lost one of our possible solutions because we're told that x is greater than or equal to minus two. Question 22. Well, this is really difficult, but I guess it's the last question on the paper, so it's allowed to be. So the first thing you need to do is get a really good sketch to help you gather your thoughts. So it's over here. So just process the information that they've given you, and this is a good sketch of it. Now, um, I need to get a couple of relationships between J and K to be able to work this out. The first thing I can do is focus on Pythagoras and on the distance between j and k so i'm hooking out this right angle triangle from up here going j to k and then just creating a right angle triangle all right so it's basically i'm just dropping down a vertical here popping in a horizontal and i know that the distance from j to k is root 80 okay j to k is root 80 so what is the height of this triangle well it's the difference between my y coordinates so it's so it's um it's uh k minus 15 and what is my x coordinate is the difference between my x coordinates so that's my 6 minus j all right k minus 15 is my y y value 6 minus j is my x value and i know that that is um root 80 is that length so just by processing that pythagoras this squared plus this squared equals root 80 squared so that's my first line of workings up here okay that's just pythagoras now i need really to be able to substitute something in to lose one of these variables so i'm now going to consider the the relationship between j and k in terms of the gradient now because my gradient from h to m is 2 h to m is 2 my gradient from j to k because it's a perpendicular line flip it over change the sign the gradient from j to k is going to be minus a half okay so again considering this triangle triangle the gradient the y step over the x step is going to be minus a half so k minus 15 over 6 minus j equals minus a half so that's really our second equation so we've now got two equations two unknowns we can solve this so multiply by 6 minus j, multiply out the bracket, make k the subject, we get k equaling 12 plus a half j. Substitute this knowledge, this linear knowledge in up here, so I'm replacing the k with 12 plus a half j. I've now got a complicated equation admittedly, but it's just my only unknown is j. So I've simplified the bracket, I've then multiplied out the two pairs of brackets, I've simplified it to give myself this quadratic here. A is 5 over 4, B is minus 15, C is minus 35. I've substituted that into the quadratic equation, and it gives me J being 14 or minus 2. Now, I'm told that J is less than 0, so J's got to be minus 2. Substitute that into, for example, this linear equation, the easier one. Okay, we get K being 11.